What I've prepared is uh, three parts. Um, a first part in which I uh, want to give a, a summary of the concept of empire because it's necessary for the next two parts. The next two parts are um, problems I'm working on now, a second part about war, and a third part about democracy. Um, these, especially these last two parts about war and democracy are, um, are things that I'm working on now and I don't have completely figured out. And so this is the kind of, um, <clears throat> Actually, the kind of presentation I like, but I wanted to uh, explain to you the spirit of it. It's more it, what it is, rather than presenting to you something that I already understand, it's more uh, saying something like, here are the problems I'm trying to work on. Please help me think about them. So um, I hope you'll take them in that spirit. Except the first part about empire, that I have figured out, and, uh, and I just feel the need to uh, explain what I understand about it. For the, for the rest. Um, <clears throat> so about empire, it seems to me that our uh, concept of empire that Tony Negri and I have articulated is most easily understood from the perspective of sovereignty. You tell me, I assume you can hear me. And also, if I speak too fast at a certain point, like raise your hand, stop me. But it sounds fine. OK. Um, we start from the from the notion, rather common notion, that the uh, sovereignty of nation states is declining or has declined recently, uh, in particular with respect to capital. In other words, that, they're the, that nation states are increasingly unable to control movements of goods, of technology, of, of peoples, um, and that therefore even the sovereignty of the most dominant nation states um, has somewhat declined. <clears throat> Some view this, therefore, as the um, increasing rule of the economy over the political. In other words, some would celebrate this as finally uh, capital, or the economy in general, can function free of political controls. Others, of course, um, lament this situation because uh, precisely for the same reasons, that there are no longer political controls that regulate uh, economic flows and economic production. It seems to us rather that it's important to recognize that although the sovereignty of nation states has declined, sovereignty as such has, de has not declined. In other words, throughout the co contemporary transformations, it seems to us that political controls, state functions, and regulatory mechanisms continue to rule the realm of economic and social production and exchange. Our basic hypothesis then is that sovereignty has taken a new form, and this is a form composed of a series of national and supranational organisms that are unified under a single logic of rule. This new global form of sovereignty is what we call empire. Now, I should say right away that this doesn't mean, this does not mean to say that empire or the, the globe is homogeneous and everywhere the same or even that it's more homogeneous than it was. What we mean to say rather by this notion of empire, by this new global form of sovereignty, is that um, there is now a uh, single form of power that is different internally. In other words, that is composed by differing and often conflictive elements. There are two basic ways of, under or two, Two of the simplest ways, it seems to me, of understanding this are, one, to think of this empire as a network form of power, and therefore to understand the various um, institutions and elements or organisms that compose it as being related in network form, in a distributed network form. That actually, I think, is the richest way of understanding, but also the most complex, because networks are not very easy to understand. Um, let me try the second one, which is more, which might seem more academic, but because it's older. And the, but this is our excuse for using the term, rather awkward term sometimes, empire. And that is that the ancient Roman Empire was um, celebrated as a mixed constitution. And I think this notion of mixed constitution can serve as a, an introduction to the form of sovereignty that, that this new global empire takes. This is... Um, 
you know, the classical reference is Polybius's book, The Rise of the Roman Empire. And what Polybius says, I'm not sure if any of you have had to suffer through reading the um, uh, classical political theory, this is the way it goes from Aristotle on, that there were three primary forms of government, uh, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. And of course, they're evil twins in each one, um, tyranny, oligarchy, and uh, I can't remember the bad democracy, I'm sorry. <laughs> but in any case, what, what, what Polybius says is that the mixed constitution of, of the ancient Roman Empire was it, previously governments had been one of those three or alternated among those three. The new thing about the ancient Roman Empire was it, it was all three at once. It was both at the same time monarchical, aristocratic, and democratic. This seems to us a, a first approach to trying to understand this contemporary empire. In other words, that's cool. Um, I don't know what it is. Space aliens, I think. Should we keep going? I like it. It's a good compliment. Okay, the first one, in, in, there are certain ways in which our world is monarchical and, or seems monarchical. For instance, during the wars, during this contemporary war, during the Gulf War, during Kosovo, the U.S. military functions as a monarchical power. In other words, it's a single source of power. There are other times or other registers on which power is aristocratic in our world. In other words, the rule of the few instead of the rule of one. The dominant transnational corporations are aristocratic in this sense. Or maybe more easily understood the uh, dominant nation states, say the Security Council of the United Nations or the G8, are aristocratic in this sense. Thirdly, and also simultaneously, <clears throat> we can recognize let's say, so-called democratic forms of power in our world. In other words, forms of power that at least claim to represent the people. Um, one, often the entire panoply of nation states functions this way. Think of the General Assembly of the UN as democratic in this way. It claims to represent the people. Um, also, the media function at this level, presenting themselves as representing the people. The most complicated um, instance would be um, various non-governmental organizations that are democratic in this sense, proposed as people's organizations. But of course, NGOs are all very different among themselves. It's hard to make generalizations about all of them. In any case, I hope this gives you an idea. This is the, the notion that the form of power we're facing is not one of these. It's not like one should say, we live in a, in a world with single power because the US military dominates. We can say, yes, the US military dominates at times, but it functions within a larger system that is not only monarchical, but also aristocratic and also democratic in this way. Um, I hope that gives an idea of the, uh, the kind of, um, let's see, internal differentiation, once made, what we mean to uh, identify with this concept of empire. The challenge then for our notion of the contemporary empire as a mixed constitution would be after that kind of description to discover what the various powers are and how they interact and negotiate with or dominate each other, sometimes in concert and sometimes in conflict. That's obviously the difficult part. Mixed constitution only names the problematic. It doesn't really describe the dynamics of rule, but at least gives a first indication. At that point, you could say also, what, what is it that a distributed network would tell you? Because what if you were to, rather than pose this sort of pyramidical Pyramid, pyramid structure that I just named about monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy, what if one tries to think of it in a distributed structure like the internet? Um, I think that that's actually a much more useful notion of empire as network power. But again, I say it's something, I think that requires much more investigation, you know, that's a much more difficult uh, explanation. Now, I should point out that Although I said that the sovereignty of nation states has declined with the formation of empire, this is at least our hypothesis, nation states are still obviously very powerful and play very important roles. One might say that the various powers of nation states, their economic powers, financial powers, social powers, legal powers, and so forth, that those powers have not declined, but rather have been reorganized in a new framework. And of course, this is different for different nation states. My point is that we shouldn't see empire and nation states in direct conflict or inversely related, as if the increasing power of the one were the corresponding decrease of the other. The power of nation states continues in a reorganized form under empire within a new form of sovereignty. In other words, I think many of the discussions about globalization 
quickly reach a kind of dead end or people speak past one another because the one side will say there is globalization, therefore nation states don't matter. And the other side will say nation states still matter, therefore there is no globalization. I think they're both true and one has to understand how the forms of uh, global power function with nation states, with nation states as part of them. Okay, I'll leave that part aside. Um, okay, I'll just, I'll give you an example of this. This is an example that I take from something that Saskia Sassen says now, or that she works on now, which is she, she's trying to understand how economic decisions can be made by national functionaries, but within a global framework. And what she, she does it in a sort of, studies it in an anthropological way. In other words, she goes to the meetings, like the Davos meetings, these global meetings of both um, politicians and uh, corporate leaders. And she she's, um, tries to recognize how economics ministers and people working in the economic, national economics ministries and central bankers and people working in the central banks <clears throat> in a way get trained in global capital so that they're still working within a national framework, but they're oriented towards the needs of global capital. So in one sense, they're both functionaries of, glo of, of a national capital and it's simultaneously functionaries of a global capital. In other words, that they, um, so in this way, they can, while still employed by the nation state and functioning within national structures, actually act in the interests of a supranational power. Does that make sense? I'm trying to explain the ways in which there isn't really a contradiction between thinking about national structures and a, a new form of power that, that resides at a different level. Here's then, let me give the Marxiological explanation, which if, if that kind of th stuff is, if you're allergic to that, just like, sleep for a second. The Marxiological explanation would be this, or this is the, um, when, when one thinks about the concept of capital, Marx talks about the concept of capital as a real abstraction. And what he means by it is this, is that <clears throat> actual particular capitals are always in conflict with each other. They compete with each other. That's what capitals do. That's what individual capitals do. And they each conflict with the state. It's really a, a, a scene of conflict and competition. And yet, at another, at a level of abstraction, there is, it makes sense to talk about capital as a collective thing. It's an, it's an abstraction. In other words, separate from all these individual capitals that conflict, there's actually a common logic by which they function together. And that, that, it's at that point that we, we can talk about capital as a thing or a collective capitalist. I think it's similar with the concept of empire. It too is a real abstraction in this sense because its various elements of course conflict with each other. The US nation state and the French nation state are gonna have stupid conflicts about trade or something like that. And they'll each conflict with the IMF. And they'll also, so one could say, well, all these things are conflicting. How can they act in common? Well, at a different level of abstraction, my, my argument is that it makes more sense to think of them acting together than, than acting uh, in conflict. That's what's meant by a real abstraction here. Okay. The sovereignty of the nation state, it seems to me, was the cornerstone of the imperialisms that the European powers constructed throughout the modern era, especially the, colonialist, the colonial projects. By empire, however, we understand something altogether different from imperialism. The boundaries defined by the modern system of nation states was fundamental to European colonialism and to, to their economic expansion. The territorial boundaries of the nation delimited the center of power from which, from which rule was exerted over external foreign territories through a system of channels and barriers that alternately facilitated and obstructed the flows of production and circulation. Imperialism was really an extension of the sovereignty of the European nation states beyond their own boundaries. The imperialist era also was characterized by the contest among uh, European powers, along eventually with the US and Japan on the international scene. Now, in contrast to imperialism, empire establishes no territorial center of power and doesn't rely on fixed boundaries or barriers. Empire is in this sense a decentered and deterritorializing apparatus of rule. In fact, it's not even decentered; it's distributed in the same way that the internet is. It's a deterritorializing de apparatus that progressively incorporates the entire global realm within its open, expanding frontiers. 
Empire, therefore, manages hybrid identities, flexible hierarchies, and plural exchanges through modulating networks of command. And finally, empire is a single sovereign power. It has no peer of the same genre. In other words, to make this distinction between, between the imperialist regimes and our contemporary empire, we both think that they have a different form. The one worked on the notion of, of, a, of, a, of a centralized form of power that created boundaries and worked through them. The other empire is, has no center and works through a indistinction between inside and outside, let's say, not through boundaries. And the other is that imperialisms were always in competition. There were always several, and yet an empire rather is naming a single power. Right, one could summarize this in, in general by saying that empire is, is attempting to name a boundless form of rule. Uh, you can understand this most easily in the territorial sense. It's trying to understand a global form of rule or a form of rule that, in, that envelops the entire globe. Right, that seems enough for that. So that's, um, <clears throat> that's the general concept. I hope it, at least at a first level, it makes, makes enough sense so I, so, um, so I can go on. The second part, um, is about war and um, for me thinking about it, <clears throat> well there were two events that, that formed the way I think about it. In Croatia you have different experiences of war. For me after um, Genoa last year in which there was a certain discourse of war and then a certain relationship of violence and then uh, being in New York after September 11th also had me thinking more a more urgent way about war. Okay, and it starts with an epigraph from Voltaire. Um, Voltaire writes, uh, bien, tout est bien. Okay. The world's at war again, but it's different this time. Traditionally, war has been conceived as the armed conflict between sovereign political entities, that is, during the modern period, between nation states. In recent decades, however, the sovereign authority of nation states, even the most dominant nation states, has declined and instead there's emerging a new supranational form of power which we're calling empire. Okay, that's, insofar as that's true, <clears throat> since there is no sovereign authority above or outside this empire, there is no longer any possibility of war. Empire would thus seem to be by definition the reign of peace. And yet we find within empire innumerable armed conflicts, some locally delimited in time and space, others expansive and interminable. Empire from this perspective would seem to be the reign of perpetual war. This may not be so paradoxical, however, if we conceive the various armed conflicts across the globe as instances of civil war. In other words, whereas war, is armed conflict between sovereign political entities, between nation states. Civil war is armed conflict between non-sovereign combatants within a single sovereign territory. This civil war should be understood now not within the national space, since that is no longer the effective unit of sovereignty, but the global terrain. From this perspective, all of the world's current armed conflicts, hot and cold, in, C in Colombia, in Sierra Leone, in Aceh, in Indonesia, as much as in Israel, Palestine, and India, Pakistan, all of these should be considered imperial civil wars. This doesn't mean that any of these conflicts mobilizes all of empire, the entire globe. Indeed, each of these conflicts is local and specific, but rather that they exist within or conditioned by and in turn affect the global imperial system. Each local war should not be viewed in isolation then, but seen as part of a grand constellation, linked in varying degrees both to other war zones and to areas not presently at war. None of the combatants in these conflicts is sovereign, and none can hope to attain sovereignty. They're struggling rather for relative dominance within the hierarchies at the highest and lowest levels of the global system. The attacks on the Pentagon and the World Trade Center on September 11th then didn't create or fundamentally change this global situation, but perhaps they did force us to recognize its generality. There's no escaping the state of war within empire, and there is no end to it in sight. In fact, this state of war erodes the distinction between war and peace. There may be a cessation of hostilities at times and in certain places, 
but lethal violence is present as a constant possibility, ready always and everywhere to erupt. We can no longer imagine or even hope for a real peace. This looks something, <clears throat> this world at war looks something like the one faced by Simplicissimus, the peasant protagonist of Johann Grimmelshausen's great 17th century novel, which if you don't know the novel, just leave it aside. Uh, Simpli this is the way the novel goes. Simplicissimus is born in the midst of Germany's 30 years war in the 17th century. And true to his name, he views the world with the simplest, most naive eyes. How else can one approach such a state of perpetual conflict, suffering, and devastation? The various armies, the French, the Spanish, the Swedish, the Danish, along with the various Germanic forces, pass through one after the other, each claiming more virtue and religious rectitude than the last. But to simply Kisimus's eyes, they're all the same. They kill, they rape, they steal. Simply Kisimus's innocent open eyes manage to register the horror without being destroyed by it. They see through all the mystific mystifications that cloud his brutal reality. Today, in the face of interminable battles with one side worse than the other, how can we achieve something like Simplicissimus's innocent perspective? And is that indeed our only alternative? European modernity was born in certain respects in response to generalized states of war, such as the Thirty Years' War in Germany and the civil wars in England. One central component of the political project of Enlightenment liberalism was to destroy the state of war by isolating war at the margins of society and limiting it to exceptional times. Only the sovereign authority, that is, the monarch or the state, could wage war and only against another sovereign power. War, in other words, was expelled from the internal national social field and reserved only for external conflicts between states. War was to be the exception and peace the norm. So now I want to read a few of the, what seem to be principal theorists of war during, during the modern period, really the 19th and 20th centuries, and uh, to understand better what war was then so I can see what, what seems to me different about war now. The separation of war from politics was the goal, or a goal, of modern political thought and practice. Even for the so-called realist theorists, who indeed focus on the centrality and importance of war. Consider, for example, the oft-cited maxim of Karl von Clausewitz, the 19th century Prussian military officer and philosopher. Clausewitz said that war is the continuation of politics by other means. Read in isolation, this might seem to pose a continuity between politics and war. But really, Clausewitz's notion has nothing to do with political relations within a society and refers exclusively instead to political conflicts between nation states. In other words, for Clausewitz, war is an instrument in the service of a state's goals in the realm of international politics. War thus in Clausewitz's view is completely separate from the political struggles and conflicts that exist within a society. Consider also, secondly, Karl Schmitz, the 20th century German philosopher, his famous notion that political actions and motives are all based fundamentally on the friend-enemy distinction, that the, the, the concept of the political is based on this friend-enemy distinction. Here too it might seem that politics and war have become indistinguishable, but again the politics that Schmidt is referring to is not that within a society, but only politics, only a war between sovereign states. The only real enemy, according to Schmidt, is a public enemy, that is, a sovereign enemy of the state. This conception is common to the dominant veins of modern thought among liberals and anti-liberals alike. For all of them, since war is isolated to the conflicts between sovereign states, then politics within each society should be, at least in normal circumstances, free from war. To the extent that today the sovereignty of nation states is declining and this new sovereignty at a global level is forming that we're calling empire, to the extent that this is true, then the modern strategy of isolating war to interstate conflicts, sorry, it's just it's warm. <clears throat> Might be more interesting than what I read, too. That would be. Um, I know. <laughs> That's, it's, the last, it's, the, it's the last resort when you feel that it's not interesting enough for somebody. Just, um, OK, since this is, since if, if we're saying that if, if it's true what Negri and I hypothesized that, 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 
that the sovereignty of nation states is declining and rather sovereignty is forming at a, at a, a supranational level. Um, then this modern strategy of isolating war to interstate conflicts is no longer viable. We thus have to reconsider in this new light the relationship between war and politics. This is really what I'm doing in this whole section, is trying to think how do war and politics relate to each other. Realists like Clausewitz and Schmidt, on the one hand, whom I just talked about, they would view such a development as the end of politics entirely. Politics here, of course, understood strictly as interstate relations. There's, on the other hand, a longstanding liberal dream from Kant's notion of perpetual peace to the practical projects that led to the League of Nations and then the United Nations that conceives of the end of war between sovereign states as the end of the possibility of war altogether and thus as the, the universal rule of politics. The community or society of nations would thus extend the, the, the space of social peace to the entire globe. Today, however, instead of moving forward to peace in fulfillment of this dream, we seem to have been catapulted back in time into the nightmare of a perpetual and indeterminate state of war, with no clear distinction between the maintenance of peace and acts of war. Once the isolated space and time of war in the limited conflict between sovereign states has declined, war seems to have been generalized back to the entire social field. Today, at the beginning of the 21st century, we're confronted with several wars that are not posed against sovereign, conventionally conceived enemies, and that thus tend to collapse the distinctions between war and other realms of human activity. The exceptional character of war is undermined in the process, and war becomes confused with normal social interaction and conflict. Perhaps in this situation, we have to recognize a real continuity between war and politics within society, or even between war and the functioning of power itself. Michel Foucault, for example, polemically reverses the Clausewitz formulation in his lectures at the Collège de France in the mid-1970s to claim that politics is really a continuation of war by other means. Uh, this is his lectures that are published in French, and I think not in English yet, um, which in French are titled Il faut, il, il faut défendre la société, uh, one has to defend society, which were, they were the lectures of a year of courses that he gave. War, Foucault argues, is really the primary organizing principle of society and politics, uh, is the primary organizing principle of society as a whole, and politics is merely one of its means or guises. What appears as civil peace, then, really only puts an end to one form of war and opens another. Now, theorists of insurrection and revolutionary politics, of course, particularly in the anarchist and communist traditions, have long made similar claims about the indistinction of war and politics. Uh, think, for example, for example, of uh, Mao Zedong, who claims that politics is simply war without bloodshed. Or, in a more complicated way, Antonio Gramsci divides political strategies between wars of position and wars of maneuver. These theorists, however, are dealing with exceptional social periods, that is, with times of insurrection and revolution. What's distinctive and new about Foucault's claim is that it refers to power in its normal functioning, everywhere and always. The socially pacifying function of political power, according to his hypothesis, involves constantly reinscribing this fundamental relationship of force in a sort of silent war and reinscribing it too in the social institutions, the systems of economic inequality, and even the spheres of personal and sexual relations. Foucault attempts to see war, in other words, as the general matrix for all relations of power and techniques of domination. In this conception, the concept of war has lost all of its specificity. War designates all relations of force, whether bloodshed is involved or not, regardless of the form of violence employed. The distinction between war and peace has been entirely erased. Now, it seems to me that Foucault's hypothesis must be read historically and should be referred to the period of his thinking this in the late 20th century and what corresponds to our notion of the emergence of empire. His notion in this sense would be a symptom of the end of the modern separation of war from politics. Now, let me try on another register more like thinking about war in common public discourse. Common public usage of the concept of war has indeed changed in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. 
War, of course, has long been used metaphorically to describe various forms of competition and relations of force that don't generally involve lethal violence or bloodshed, such as sports, commerce, and domestic politics. The metaphorical usage in such cases serves to highlight the risks, competition, and conflict involved in these various activities, but it also rests on their differences from real war, which remains distinct and separate. For instance, if we talk about in a football match that, we, that one team is going to war with another, or if we talk about uh, one corporation going to war with another, we think of it as metaphorical. There isn't norm we think of that, we use the metaphor to emphasize the, the competition and risks involved, but, but really think of it as something separate from real war. In other cases, the metaphorical discourse of war is invoked as a strategic political maneuver in order to achieve the total mobilization of social forces for a united purpose that's typical of a war effort. Thinking in the US framework, the war on poverty, for example, launched in the United States in the mid-1960s by the Johnson administration, it used the discourse of war to avoid partisan conflict and rally national forces for a domestic policy goal. In other words, Johnson's project to uh, have social programs to alleviate poverty, he called it a war on poverty, in order to discourage political uh, divisions, to have a mobilized social, entire society mobilized as an effort. Since poverty, however, is an abstract enemy and the means of battle are generally nonviolent, the war discourse in this case remains merely rhetorical. Now with the war on drugs, however, which began in the US in the 1980s, and more so with the, with the current war on terrorism, the rhetoric of war begins to take a more concrete character. As in the case of the war on poverty, here too, the enemies are posed not as specific nation states or political communities or even individuals, but rather as abstract concepts or perhaps as sets of practices. Much more successfully than the war on poverty, these discourses of war serve to mobilize all social forces and suspend or limit normal political exchange. And yet these wars are not so metaphorical because like war traditionally conceived, they involve armed combat and lethal force. We've thus proceeded from metaphorical and rhetorical invocations of war to real wars against indefinite immaterial enemies. I think there are two consequences of this, or two occur to me as most important. The first consequence is that these new kinds of war, of these new kinds of war, is that the limits of war are rendered indeterminate, both spatially and temporally. The war against a nation state is clearly defined spatially, even if at times it can spread to other countries. And the end of such a war is also marked with either victory or truce or surrender. War against a concept or a set of practices, in contrast, some, somewhat like a war of religion, has no definite spatial or temporal boundaries. Such wars can potentially extend anywhere for any period of time. A, a second consequence of these new wars is a reorientation of the conception of the sides of battle, of the conditions of enmity, of friend and enemy distinction, really. To the extent that the enemy is abstract and unlimited, the alliance of friends, too, is expansive and potentially universal all of humanity can potentially be united against an abstract concept or practice, such as terrorism. It shouldn't be surprising then that the concept of just war has recently emerged again in the discourse of politicians, journalists, and scholars, particularly in the context of the war on terrorism and the various military operations conducted in the name of human rights. The concept of justice serves to universalize war beyond any particular interest toward the interest of humanity as a whole. Now we should keep in mind that modern political thinkers, I'm thinking of from the 17th to the 20th centuries, modern political thinkers sought to banish the concept of just war, which had, be, which had become common throughout the Middle Ages in Europe, especially during the Crusades and the religious wars, because they thought the, the concept of just war tended to generalize war beyond its proper scope and confuse it with other social realms, such as morality and religion. Justice does not belong to the concept of war, they thought. When the modern realist theorists of war, like I mentioned Clausewitz and Schmidt before, when they claim that war is a means for political ends, they intend not only to link it to state politics, but also to separate it from other social realms, such as morality and religion. In other words, saying that war is political means that it's not a question of morality, and it's not a question of religion. The various other social realms, indeed, have often throughout history been superimposed on war, 
especially in propaganda campaigns, such that the enemy might be presented as evil or ugly or sexually perverse. But the modern theorists insisted on this fundamental separation. War, they thought, could thus be isolated to its proper, necessarily, and rational functions. These just wars of the late 20th and early 21st centuries often carry explicit or implicit echoes of the old wars of religion. And the various concepts of civilizational conflict, the West versus Islam, for instance, that animate a strong vein of international relations today and also of public discourse, all of these are never far removed from the old religious paradigm. Along with the renewed concept of just war then comes too, predictably, the allied concept of evil. Posing the enemy as evil serves to make the enemy and the struggle against it absolute. Evil is the enemy of all humanity. Modern philosophers tried to put a rest to this problem too, the problem of evil, the great Christian debate over theodicity, or at least separate it from the question of politics and war. This is in a way the problem that Voltaire is dealing with and that I was uh, thinking of at the beginning. And more important for our purposes, these resurrected discourses of justice and evil are symptoms of the ways in which war has changed and lost the limitations that modernity had tried to impose on it. Finally, one other consequence, like justice, democracy too does not belong to war. Think for an example, this is my um, weakness that I always think in these terms. Over two millennia ago, Thucydides counseled against mixing democracy and war in the, the Peloponnesian Wars. But whereas Thucydides was concerned with the most efficient way to make war, he thought that democracy was no, no use in conducting war, we're interested instead in the conditions of possibility for democracy. War requires the partial or total suspension of democratic participation and exchange through strict hierarchy and obedience. The total mobilization required of a society at war necessarily undermines democracy. In the modern period, the wartime suspension of democratic politics was usually posed as temporary since war was conceived as an exceptional condition. If instead today the state of war has become our permanent condition within empire, then the suspension of democracy too tends to become normal rather than exceptional. This is the context in which Foucault's general analysis of, war, of power as war might seem perfectly applicable. And this is a world, a world in which democracy has become impossible and perhaps even unthinkable. Now our objective then, one might say, should be peace at all costs so that we might begin to reconstruct the democracy we once had. In other words, let's please return to that modern paradigm, imperfect as it was. My sense, however, is that the road may not be so simple and that also the rewards may be much greater. We have to understand better, first, this state of war that has become no longer an exception to the logic of government, but a form of rule itself. Peace and democracy are nowhere to be found on Sarizen. We need to invent a new form of democracy, and perhaps to a new form of peace, to escape eventually the state of war. Um, let me summarize this part before going on that is, uh, you might think, incomplete. Maybe it is, but um, that's how far it goes so far. Here's the points. <clears throat> First, if empire is now a single sovereign power, if there's a forming a global power, then there's no more war as it was conventionally conceived in modernity, that is, conflict between sovereign nation states. From this perspective, all wars are now civil wars. Two, the modern conception of war was based on the separation of war from politics. Three, the new state of civil war brings with it an end to the separation of war from politics and corresponds in instead to a form of politics that is indistinct from war, something like what Foucault described. And four, this generalized state of war makes democracy, in at least in its modern form, impossible. Okay, for the last bit, I, let me begin by reversing the, the logic. Um, my feeling is that this permanent state of civil war in empire is not only the cause, but also in some sense the result of a contemporary lack in democracy, and moreover, a lack in the concept of democracy. The end of the Cold War was to be the ultimate victory of democracy, but in the age of globalization today, the concept and practices of democracy are everywhere in crisis. 
The rhetoric of democracy remains as a presupposition, but if one looks with care at any of the proposals to the reform the global system, it's immediately evident that none of them really confronts the question of democracy. Freedom, stability, prosperity, and even poverty are all debated. Democracy is not even on the agenda. Democracy is not on the agenda in part at least because it's not clear what democracy means in a globalized world. One cannot simply take the modern concept of democracy developed in the context of nation states along with its various representative institutions, electoral processes, labor unions, citizens groups, and so forth, and project them onto a global screen. The modern conception of representation, stretched so thin across the global terrain, cannot support a substantial notion of democracy. That's that, the last sentence is really what I, um, what I want to articulate, in a way how, the, how the, the democracy that we've inherited is no longer adequate. So that's what I, I'll spend a few minutes doing. Um, right, as usual, I need to look backwards um, and try to explain what seems to me central about the modern concept, concept of democracy. The modern notion of democracy was based, the dominant element of it was based on representational institutions and structures within the bounded national space that were dependent in a way on national sovereignty. What was represented in the democratic national institutions was the people, and hence, modern national sovereignty tended to take the form of popular sovereignty. The claim that the nation was sovereign, in other words, tended to become identical to the claim that the people was sovereign. But what or who is the people? The people's not a natural or empirical entity. One can't arrive at the identity of the people by summing up or even averaging the entire population. The people, rather, is a representation that creates of the population a unity. I want to emphasize three elements that seem central in that claim, that, um, that the people is a representational, that the people as sovereign is a representational uh, result. First of all, the people is one. This is something that um, Thomas Hobbes in particular, but the tradition of modern political thought emphasized. Um, the people can only be sovereign they claimed as an identity, as a unity. Uh, the multitude can't be sovereign. The, the multiplicity of elements can't be sovereign. Only, only a unity can be sovereign, and the people in that sense is one. Secondly, the key to the construction of the people as unity is representation. The empirical multiplicity of the population, in other words, is made an identity through mechanisms of representation. And here we should include both the political and the aesthetic con connotations of the term representation. Representation both as proxy, think of in, in political representation, or as portrait in aesthetic terms. Third, these mechanisms of representation are based on a notion and a condition of measure. And by measure here, I mean not so much a quantifiable condition, but rather a bounded one. A bounded or measured multiplicity can be represented as a unity, but the immeasurable, the boundless, can't be represented. This is one sense in which the notion of the people is intimately tied to the bounded national space. In short, the people is not an immediate nor an eternal identity, but rather the people is the result of a complex process that's proper to a specific social formation and specific historical period. In other words, the institutions of representation in the national, in the national space. We can simplify this complex situation for a moment and consider only the institutional, political mechanisms of representation, of which the electoral process was at least ideological the, mo the, the most important. The notion of one person, one vote, for example, was one of the ideals towards which the various modern scheme of popular representation and sovereignty tended. There's no need for me to argue here that the, that the schema of popular representation, the electoral schema, <coughs> have always been in, in imperfect and in many cases largely illusory. There have long been important critiques of the mechanisms of popular representation in modern democratic societies. I think that today, however, popular representation is undermined in a more basic and fundamental way. In these contemporary processes of globalization, in what we call the passage to empire, national space loses its definition. National boundaries, although still important, are relativized, and even national imaginaries are destabilized. As national sovereignty is displaced by the authority of a new supranational power, by this empire that, we're talk that we uh, propose, 
Political reality loses its measure. In this situation, the impossibility of representing the people becomes increasingly clear, and thus the concept of the people itself tends to evaporate. From an institutional political perspective, imperial sovereignty conflicts with and even negates any conception of popular sovereignty. Consider, for example, the functioning of the supranational economic institutions, such as the World Bank, the IMF, and the WTO. To a large extent, the conditionality required by these institutions, especially by the IMF, takes out of the hands of nation states decisions over economic and social policy. The subordinate nation states most visibly, but also the dominant ones, are subject to the rule of these institutions. It's clear that these supranational economic institutions do not and cannot represent the people, except in the most distant and abstract sense, in the sense, for example, that some nation states, which in some way represent their peoples, designate representatives to the institutions. If one looks for representation in such institutions, there will always inevitably remain what they call a democratic deficit. It's no accident, in other words, that these institutions are so isolated from popular representation. They function precisely to the extent that they avoid mechanisms of popular representation. Now, some of the best liberal Euro-American theorists of globalization do, in fact, argue that we need to reform the global system and reinforce the mechanisms of democratic political rule. But even they don't imagine that such supranational institutions could ever become representative in any popular sense. One of the fundamental obstacles is the problem of determining what or who is the people in such a conception. One would presumably have to develop a notion of the global people that extends beyond any national or ethnic conception to unite the entirety of humanity, a challenge that seems to me well outside the scope of all this liberal theorizing. What then does constitute <clears throat> democratic reform in the views of the various leading liberal reformers? And I'm thinking of uh, people like uh, Robert Cohane in the United States, Joe Stieglitz, the ex-chair uh, economist for the uh, World Bank, David Held, Richard Falk, and Ulrich Beck. In other words, these people who are sort of um, float between universities and, 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 and government positions, the, who propose that we need a more democratic global system, what do they have in mind? That's what I'm asking. And so I read, the, after reading them, this is my conclusion. First of all, it's striking, in fact, how widespread is the use of the term democracy among their writings and how universally they accept it as a goal. One major component of, de of democratic reform, in their view, is simply greater transparency. Now, transparency itself, however, is not democracy and doesn't constitute representation. A more substantive notion, which is omnipresent in their writings, is accountability, which is often paired with the notion governance. The concept of accountability could refer to mechanisms of popular representation, but in fact in these discourses it doesn't, it does not. One has to ask accountable to whom, and then we find that the reformers do not propose making global institutions accountable to a global or even a national people. The people, precisely, is missing. The reform would involve rather making global institutions accountable to other institutions, and especially to a community of experts. In other words, if the IMF were more transparent and accountable to economic experts, there would be safeguards against its implementing disastrous policies, such as those dictated by the IMF in Southeast Asia in the late 1990s, or in Argentina more recently. This is, for instance, Joe Stieglitz, who's become famous in a way for criticizing the IMF, ex-World Bank economist criticizing the IMF, he criticized the IMF for a lack of accountability in its policies towards Southeast Asia. But when you then say accountable to whom, he wants them to be more accountable to World Bank economists. So it's not that they should be accountable to other people, it's that they need uh, accountable really to him or to his, to his, um, to his people. What's central and most interesting to me about the use of the terms accountability and governance in these discussions is that these terms straddle so comfortably the political and the economic realms. Accountability and governance have long been central concepts in the theoretical vocabulary of capitalist corporations. The notions of accountability and governance seem to be directed most clearly at assuring economic efficiency and stability and not at constructing any popular or representational form of democratic control. In the final analysis, although the, term of, although the term democracy is omnipresent in these writings, 
No global version of democracy in its modern liberal form, that is, as popular representation, is even on the agenda. It seems, in fact, that the greatest conceptual obstacle that prevents these theorists from imagining a global representative schema is precisely the notion of the people. Who is the global people? It seems impossible today to grasp the people as a political subject and moreover to represent it institutionally. My point here is that within the traditional framework based on a modern conception of democracy, the democratic reform of these global institutions is impossible. I take these liberal reformist theorists to be honest and well-meaning, which I'm sure they are. So for me, the fact that democracy drops out of their discussions is a symptom of this impossibility. Let me try a brief thought experiment to make this clearer or more concrete. <clears throat> Let's try to apply the modern the central element of the modern notion of democratic representation, the electoral process, one person, one vote. Let's try to um, apply that to the global level of government. Imagine a representative system, for example, to elect the leaders of the IMF, the World Bank, and the WTO, and the other supranational organizations. Imagine such a representative system based on the principle of one person, one vote, globally. There could be, this is just my like trying to help imagine the system, there could be a two-tiered election process whereby the global voting population of approximately four billion, there's six billion people in the world, say four billion or over 18, um, the, the four billion could be divided into 400 districts of 10 million people each. North Americans would thus elect about 20 of these electors, the Europeans and Indonesians, another 20 each, whereas the Chinese and Indians would elect, say, 180, respectively. And maybe the voting districts could be drawn so as not to follow the old national borders, since so many of the nation states themselves are so corrupt and anti-democratic. In any case, these resulting 400 electors would then vote in turn to elect the leaders of the global institutions. Now, I must say that I find something appealing in this global voting scheme. Uh, for one thing, it restores the sense of equality that was central to the modern con conception of democratic representation. Even the UN General Assembly, often presented as the most democratic of existing global institutions, even the General Assembly is completely skewed in terms of representation. Um, within the framework of US institutions, you could think of the General Assembly of the UN something like the Senate functions in the United States where each nation gets equal representation regardless of population. And that thought experiment that I just proposed, that would be something like the House of Representatives in the United States, where nations like US and France would get relatively small numbers of representatives, small states like Rhode Island and Massachusetts, for instance, compared to China and India, which would be something like Texas and California. Now, this is certainly appealing, as I said, but I don't present this example as if it were a proposal to be pursued practically. In fact, I think that as one articulates such an example, it quickly becomes clear that it would be absurd in practice. The modern concept of representation, stretched so thin across the global terrain, this is where I started, cannot support a substantial notion of democracy. This is my general point. The modern notion of democracy, along with the various institutions of democratic representation and expression, designed as they were for the national space, cannot function on the global terrain. This is why the global institutions cannot be reformed democratically, because an adequate global conception of democracy is lacking. It seems to me that democracy is a problem again. We're facing a challenge for the theory and practice of democracy, much like that faced in early modern Europe. The Europeans adopted the notion of democracy from the classical tradition, principally from Athens, but they couldn't simply apply it in the form it was given. They had to transform the concept of democracy and invent new practices that were adequate to their own historical situation. For example, from the city-state to the nation-state. It's important to recognize and appreciate how radical a project of transformation was accomplished by early modern European politics and philosophy because we may be today at a similar moment of historical passage, one in which we have to reinvent democracy again. Let me just summarize looking backwards to the two parts. The, it's starting at the end, it seems to me that we have a political task to accomplish, both theoretical and practical task, that is, the reinvention of democracy adequate to our global world, a democracy that is either non-representative or differently representative. <clears throat> 
Two, this task is complicated by the fact that we are in a permanent state of war, which necessarily undermines or suspends the possibility of democracy. Three, furthermore, the distinction between war and politics has declined, so that in order to address this political task, we are forced to confront or maybe even enter into war. Um, and what exactly this means, I'm not sure. Like what it means for us to have to uh, confront or enter into war is what, um, well, maybe you can, uh, that seems to me a question uh, to, ad to address. It just to end, to end really, uh, these various globalization protest movements from Seattle to Gothenburg to Genoa seem to me first experiments to address these questions, Exper experiments that offer initial indications of what may become politically pl possible today, experiments both in um, the use of force and experiments in construction of alternative uh, frameworks of democracy. So I want to end there. And I wanted just to return as I end to the, um, what I open with this sort of spirit in which I'm presenting this, which is, um, I guess I'd have to, I feel the need again to uh, apologize in only presenting problems and not uh, presenting any answers. Um, but the, the, yeah, the spirit in which I present it rather is, these seem to me like important problems today. <clears throat> I don't yet have answers for them, but I think we need answers to them. Um, both, both really, the question of war, that is, what the relationship of violence is in our world, um, if in fact, as I'm um, claiming that, we, that peace is not really a question, what does it mean for us to be, to do politics within a state of war? And the second is, what do we mean by democracy? And what can we mean by democracy? Um, and it seems to me that we can't accept, and no one really does accept, the corrupt and crisis-ridden institutions of democracy we already have. What can we, what and how can we uh, propose something, something different for them? So anyway, I stop, I stop there and, and hope that you have more answers than I do. Thanks. I'll wait till you have questions. Yeah. You already do, good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I didn't understand that last part. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, I think of it. Um, right. Right. Okay. Let me. There are two things I wanted. Okay. Well, let me try the first one, then then have you ask the second one, because I tend to forget. And um, the, so the question I'm not sure you all heard was. Um, isn't empire always at war with barbarians? And are those barbarians outside? And, and what implications does that have? Um, the, it seems to me, I mean, one of Negri and my, one of our um, sort of metaphorical um, insistences is that there is no en outside to this empire. In other words, that all, dif all differences and even alternatives arise from within. Um, so that the... Uh-huh. Absolutely. Yes, right. We don't, when, when one proposes that there is no more outside, it doesn't mean at all that there's no alternative and that there are no differences. It means that those differences in a way arise from within rather than separated outside. And there's certain, um, there's certain limitations to these uh, metaphors, at which point one has to accept the differences. What... Um, I guess what we want to what we want to emphasize is that um, the 
Well, there are two things. One is that there, it seems to us there is no escaping, that we're all in a way complicit with or, or contaminated by this form of power. Okay, let me give you two. I, I, I hope I don't go on too long about this, but there's two ways that seems important to me. Let me start with the most practical one, which is you know personal and idiosyncratic, but it might correspond to something with you, which is that um, in the 1980s in the U.S., as I you know was involved in whatever started to be involved in political movements, there was a great discourse about uh, this kind of purity in the movement. It's a very moralizing movement at the time, um, and thinking of ourselves as separate from the forms of domination. You know, it could, it could have to do with the movies we watched, the food we ate. It was a sort of maintenance of our own purity. I think it's, and it, and it irritated me. And see, it's also seemed politically uh, counterproductive. I think that recognizing our complicity or our contaminatedness or our internalness to the various forms of power is important. And that being implicated in and contaminated by doesn't mean we can't challenge them and do something different. So that was the, the personal one. Here's the other, here's the, um, here's one of the academic responses, which is, uh, it seems to me very much like uh, Marx's conception of the revolutionary potential of the proletariat, which goes like this. Um, of course the proletariat's internal to capital. Proletariat is created by capital. The proletariat is continually producing and reproducing capital itself. So it's a mutual internal relationship between the two. And yet, that doesn't mean that the proletariat is devoid of, of potential for change or alternatives. In fact, it has much more potential, in Marx's view, than all of the relationships outside of capital, all of the non-capitalist forms of production. So Marx doesn't say, yes, be anti-capitalist by insisting on um, pre-capitalist forms in Europe or, or outside of Europe. He says, no, rather, what will happen is capital creates itself internally the um, the conditions for its own for its own destruction and its own alternative, and I think that that's the way we also view the what we talk about the barbarians within empire as being that they are arise from within and have transformative potential, despite their internalness, well, or even because of their internal character. And as I said, it, it, often I often I find that the the way we're using the metaphors doesn't correspond to the way someone else is, and that's what does the conflict rather than a real disagreement, but. Change rule, ruling. Yes. Right. That's true. I mean, that's certainly, and that's a, um, let's put it this way, it, the most radical experiments of representational democracy during the modern era were ones in which, which emphasized the, um, destruction of representation in a way. I mean, the refusal of it. Think of, um, I hate to keep giving Marx examples, but <laughs> they come to mind. I mean, think of the, you know, Marx's enthusiasm about the Paris Commune was, the the of course I know you're versed in the Marxian ones, but they, uh, I, I'm, I'm monomaniacal tonight. Um, that uh, one of the enthusiasms about the Paris Commune is, that, is its representational mechanisms. I mean, in a way, the, the Commune is pushing representation to its limits. In other words, in the clubs, each night they can vote people out, that the terms of, uh, of, of electability are in a way roost, uh, kept to a minimum. And that seems to me something like uh, what you're saying is that, um, is that one of the functions of representation is the, uh, is the, is the refusal of representatives and therefore voting them out. I, I think that also, uh, do I pose the term right? I mean, voting them out of power does seem, <clears throat> if one thinks of them as not representative, then one votes them out. I think we also have to, I mean, I also tend towards non-representative uh, experiments, but that's another matter and not necessarily um, in, in conflict with claims of representation. Yeah. On what I said. Yeah. 
Right. What are the asymmetries of, um, of benefits that the empire uh, provides for various members of the empire? For example, people in Croatia and people within Croatia, people in the United States. People right. People in the United States don't benefit the same within the empire. And Absolutely. The structural disparities and asymmetries in the benefits are probably crucial for our activism. Uh, right. No, I just, you, 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 th- complicated it much more with the last two words so that was um but you're you're absolutely right that what one the 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 attempt here is to um understand a um a management of differences and of hierarchies within a single system so that uh you're right that to say like i i don't one doesn't one shouldn't think that this is a that this is uh now in any way a homogeneous system In, in certain ways the um the disparities of wealth and poverty and of power and powerlessness have, in fact, increased in, in the recent changes over the last decades. Um, what, the, what our hypothesis is really is that those disparities are, ma- are managed differently, that the hierarchies are managed differently, in a way in a more complex system than, than, than was done when it's fundamentally, or when one conceives it, it's fundamentally nation states that manage the... Um, the differences. Right, and yeah, right, because I haven't, I haven't talked about that. Um, well, one way to approach it is what you were suggesting. Here's uh, like one simple. Um, yeah, here's, here's one uh, proposition of the concept of empire that's formulated like those tests that you have to take to go to university, where um, like X, A is to B as C is to D. Um, the nation state functioned for national capital, a regulatory role that, um, that guaranteed the um, long-term collective interests of national capital. In other words, at least this is a, a reduced but, but fundamentally accurate, I think, conception, which is that, of course, national capitals all conflict with each other and conflict with the state, but the nation state is necessary as a regulatory mechanism to guarantee the collective national capital's long-term collective interests. Insofar as today, there is something that can be called global capital, or to the extent that there exists, exists global capital, their uh, nation states, even the most dominant nation states, can no longer um, guarantee its long-term collective interests. It can no longer sufficiently regulate it. In other words, capital needs something more than nation states. So the, the proposition is that uh, what the nation state was to national capital, empire is to global capital. So the, this might seem like a circuitous route to get back to the question, which is um, the, it, it, to a certain extent, I don't think this is sufficient, but it's to a certain extent the, um, the inequalities of, of wealth and power are a function of the interests of global capital. Um, and they are in a variety of ways. I mean, in the, in the uh, traditional ways that, that capital functions through, um, through inequalities of wealth and requires inequalities of wealth, but also some new ways in which um, in which the, let's see, internal transformations of capital or the transformations of the uh, forms of production make increasingly large populations in the world useless from the perspective of capital. In other words, that, that, don't, that don't in fact produce significant quantities of value. Um, so there are ways in which, I, I wanted to say that there, there are traditional ways in which the, the logic of capital is always required inequalities, and there are certain new ways in which the contemporary relationships of capital require or create even greater disparities. So anyway, that's one way of answering that capital requires it. Does that mean, is that the kind of thing that you're thinking of? Well, if, right, if one were to, it's always that way when one describes things, uh, when, also when you look backwards, you can say, 
uh, that such and such an institution was formed um, in order to match the interests of global capital. The, the, the historical transformations never work that way. Um, but, but yes, there, there are ways in which this, uh, this empire yeah, corresponds to the needs of global capital. That's, uh, yeah, that's certainly, that's certainly part of it, or that's certainly one way of approach of it. I, I wouldn't say that that's the, it seems to me that that's the wrong way to understand the um, causal mechanisms of history. Like, it's not like um, the, uh, the leaders of the biggest corporations in the world got together and they said, yeah, okay, never mind. 